Morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. So my name is Chris Ferris. I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO for Open Technology at IBM. I basically have all the open source and open standards work that we do. And I'm going to talk about <clears throat> a project I've been working on now for the past two and a half years called Hyperledger. And I'll give you a little bit of a story about how it came to be, where we are today, and where I think we're heading in the future. So let's just start by sort of establishing a premise. I can't really, I don't have enough time to go into why blockchain is important, what it can do, and so forth. But let's just uh, assert that blockchain is, has a huge amount of potential for the enterprise. I mean, everybody's familiar with Bitcoin. Everybody's heard of Bitcoin, right? Everybody's heard of Ethereum, right? These are essentially platforms for cryptocurrency. But the underlying technology, the blockchain itself, the consensus models themselves, those technologies have been around for quite a while. But it's when you bring them all together that Satoshi Nakamoto found, wow, we got this huge, huge potential for delivering something we couldn't do before. Now, enterprise has sort of been looking at blockchain technology and saying, well, we think that there's a huge amount of potential for this technology to actually transform how we do business. This is how IBM got involved. So we started looking back in <clears throat> about mid-2015, early 2015. We started exploring the blockchain space, understanding what it was, how the technology worked. We took a very close look at Ethereum, in fact. What we found was there's a number of issues with the technology that we have to evolve beyond where it was back then, even where it is today. Um, the first one was throughput, right? I'll give you three numbers, 7, 24, 2400. So 7 was about, at the time, that's about the throughput of Bitcoin transactions per second. 24 on a good day is where Ethereum is today. 2400 is Visa, 2400 transactions a second. So when we think about this, we think, you know, how do we apply this and adapt this to uh, enterprise solutions that are processing hundreds, if not thousands, or even more transactions per second. So we have a huge challenge from a throughput perspective. Latency is another one, right? You think about Bitcoin. Bitcoin transactions can take an hour or even two to settle before you've achieved the sort of the halfway point where you can say, well, this isn't going to fork again. Um, so latency is a problem. You can't exactly use Bitcoin to go in and purchase something at your local Best Buy because they're going to say, well, okay, stand in the corner for two hours while we settle your transaction, right? That's, that's not going to work. Um, governance was a problem, still is a problem, I think, in many of the Bitcoin uh, and blockchain communities. Uh, how do we get past the sort of the technical challenges and make changes that are actually going to impact people's livelihoods or their, their wealth? That's a problem. And lack of sort of foresight of governance of how we're going to manage the platforms uh, is a problem. And then finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about privacy. There's no privacy in any of those networks. They may be obscured, right? There may be anonymity, but that's not really privacy. And you can detect patterns of behavior, and you can start making inferences based on seeing the same identities being used over and over again. So the challenge that we have, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. That's, that's somebody else's challenge. The challenge that we have in the blockchain space, the challenge that we have in the blockchain space is to achieve consensus at scale Right? With high transaction throughput, low latency of confirmation of those transactions, right? To meet the enterprise requirements. And how do we do that in the context of privacy and confidentiality? And when you try and solve all those problems at the same time, you find that that's a really, really hard problem. I mean, this is like an NP kind of a problem, right? There's always trade offs, right? So the trade-off that they have in Bitcoin and even in Ethereum with proof of work is, well, we're going to sacrifice throughput and latency for true Byzantine fault tolerance, right? There's no trust. You can't trust anything. Um, but we have, I think, in the enterprise space, we have an opportunity to actually incorporate a certain amount of governance over a permissioned network that allows us to use more traditional forms of consensus, for instance. So I used to work at Sun Microsystems back in the day. My God, I realized I've been working at IBM now for almost 17 years. 
Um, but uh, I work with this guy, Bill Joy. Joy's Law is a statement that he made at one point in time that basically says no matter who you are, more smart people work for somebody else. Right? And this is true. This is true of Google. It's true of IBM. It's true of Microsoft. It's true of every large corporation you can think of that when they collaborate and work together, they're much, much, much more powerful than any one lone individual or even a lone corporation working together. So as I mentioned, IBM was starting to explore this space. And as CTO for Open Technology, Jerry Cuomo was the IBM fellow who was leading this effort uh, between research and some of the middleware teams. He came to me and he said, look, we've been working on this blockchain thing. We're not really sure what we should do with it. I want your advice. What should we do? And I said, you should open source it. I said, because think about it. Think about what this platform is. This is a platform that needs to be ubiquitous. Who's going to buy, you know, we, we, at, at one point in like the 1960s, IBM had, you know, sort of the blue enterprise, right? Everybody would say, you know, you can't go wrong buying IBM. But that, those days are gone. So it's unlikely that we're going to win IBM if we're just putting out IBM blockchain. It has to be based on technology that's shared by everybody. So it has to be open source. And so I rang up my buddy, Jim Zemlin, at the Linux Foundation, and I said, hey, I've got a proposal for you for starting a blockchain project. And he laughed at me. And I said, dude, what's? <laughs> I thought it was a good idea. He says, you have no idea. He says, you're about the eighth person to come to me and propose a project at the Linux Foundation to work on blockchain. But he said, but yours is the first one that makes any sense. He says, you know, based on IBM's long history of open source and, and uh, you know, the commitment that we have to building communities around a piece of technology, he said, this is the thing that we're going to do at the Linux Foundation. And so I got together with 30 of our best friends, and we established in early 2016, we established the Hyperledger project. Um, it's now more than just a project. It's really more of an initiative when you think about it. Um, and we have... Actually, we pulled together a total of 10 projects, and that's growing. There's actually a pipeline of additional projects that are likely to become onboarded. And we're calling this the Hyperledger Greenhouse. You think about a greenhouse, it's someplace where you grow things, where you cultivate them, right? You nurture them. So we have 10 projects, started with Hyperledger Fabric, which was the contribution from IBM. Uh, it then grew into two projects with the addition of Hyperledger Sawtooth from Intel. Then we had Hyperledger Eroha, a contribution from a Japanese fintech startup, NEC, and some, uh, some universities in Japan. Um, then we had Hyperledger Indy, which is a self-sovereign identity-based solution that's built on blockchain, um, contributed by the Sovereign Foundation. And we had Hyperledger Burrow, which was our first Ethereum-based project at Hyperledger. Sometimes people say, oh, Hyperledger and Ethereum, they're like, no. That's not true. That's a, that's a myth needs to be debunked, because that's really where the magic happens, right? So what we see now, going forward, is we're seeing these projects not competing with one another, not vying for who's the best of this or that or the other thing. Now we've got these projects collaborating with one another, building sort of synthetic pro uh, uh, projects between them, right? This is organic development within the community. And I just want to run, just sort of show you the momentum. This is the fastest growing project at the Linux Foundation ever. We now have over 250, I think, I think actually, I have a board meeting coming up on Monday, and I think it's 260. Um, we have 10 projects. We've done two major production-based releases of, of some of those projects, Fabric and Sawtooth. The numbers are actually uh, better than what I have on the chart here. I ran the numbers this morning, and we actually are at 690-something contributors to the various projects of the Hyperledger. Only about 20, no, actually it's about 18.5% of those are IBM. So a lot of people say, oh, IBM is Hyperledger. No, we're about 20% of the contributions. They're coming from all over this community. It's an amazing thing. So I invite you to come and get involved. And in the last few seconds, I want to sort of, as many of you, I think, have a flyer on your seat for Call for Code. This is an, uh, a project that IBM is really proud to be a part of. It's a global initiative 
to solve for the problem of building solutions for natural disaster preparedness. There's a $200,000 prize for the winning team, for the winning solution. And I would encourage you to visit the IBM booth, booth 401, uh, and learn more about it at noon today. So thank you very much.